Welcome to Our Hope, a production of Chosen People Ministries. Shalom. Welcome to another episode of Our Hope. Uh, For those who don't know me, my name is Abraham Vasquez, and I'm the director of digital media for Chosen People Ministries. About a year ago, Dr. Glazer and I came up with the idea of doing this podcast. Since the start of CPM in 1894, we have always utilized the latest channels of communication to get out the gospel message that Jesus is the Messiah. In the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, we had various radio programs led by our past presidents. We utilized television broadcasts, billboards, and newspaper advertising, and a lot more. And today, Chosen People Ministries has a full digital media department staffed with three full-timers, one part-timer, and myself. And we are so humbled to continue this great work for an organization that is always on the cutting edge in its approach to the gospel, to the Jewish people. So let's get started. In this week's episode, we're going to share some stories that will build your faith and give you some hope. Unless you've been hiding under a rock, then you know what's going on in the world right now. Uh, Important life events are getting canceled, schools are closed, and people everywhere are being laid off. This brings to mind just one question. When you lose everything you have, how do you keep going? This is the question Ellis had when he experienced a season of tragic loss in his life. And we hope that as you listen to his story of perseverance, that you discover the same hope he has found in Yeshua. I'm standing there. My wife has passed away and I said, God, I said, you've taken away my entire family. And what am I supposed to do? All of our grandparents had emigrated from Eastern Europe and Russia. My parents were just blue collar family. Like most of the Jewish families at that time, boys needed to go to Hebrew school. I was excited about learning to read Hebrew, I was excited about learning some things about the Jewish people. But as time went on, it really became a time just to really prepare for my bar mitzvah. But one thing that never happened is, is that no one ever sat down with me. It wasn't my parents, it wasn't the rabbi from the from the congregation, no one ever sat down with me to tell me this is what the purpose of the bar mitzvah is for. Uh, I was just looking for something that was going to give me some meaning and purpose in life. And there was no understanding of a relationship with God. It was just learning the rituals, learning Hebrew, but no connection with God at all. When I graduated from high school, I went off to Penn State and something happened. Over the next five months, I met off and on with one of the men on campus, and we began to go through uh, portions of the Old Testament. And we would look at these passages that were supposed to be about the Messiah. I didn't understand the importance. It just didn't make any sense to me. So maybe Jesus rose from the dead, but it meant absolutely nothing to me. Well, there was another meeting I went to on campus that I was invited to. It was as if a veil was lifted. All of a sudden, I understood that Jesus was my Messiah. And at that moment, I embraced him. And I knew that I had to trust him as my Messiah. I was reading about the one that I had come to know. Whereas for my bar mitzvah, I did not have that personal relationship with God. When you read God's word after you have met Jesus as your Messiah, all of a sudden it comes alive. This becomes God's personal letter to you. It just changes everything. (laughs) Colin and I only had one child. It was our daughter, Heather. It was a joy watching Heather grow. Because our faith was so important to us is that that was something that that we taught Heather. And when Heather was two and a half years old, Heather came to understand what it meant to have to trust Jesus as her savior. And so at two and a half, Heather made a decision to trust Jesus as her Messiah, and she asked Jesus to come into her heart. Heather grew up and was just, she was a delightful child. In school, she was near the top of her class. She was smart, she was intelligent. 
uh, later on uh, in her teenage years, she was the she was the child. Uh, she was the person in class that her friends would come to for advice. On January nineteenth, uh, nineteen ninety four, uh, we get a phone call. This is early in the morning, and someone said they had heard on a police scanner about a it was a blue car that was involved in a car accident. I called the school and they said she had not been in for her first two sessions, you know, for her first two classes. At that point, it was getting really upsetting. And so I'll never forget, and I opened the door to go in the garage, hit the garage door opener, and as the garage door had gone up probably just a couple of feet, I watched a car pulling into the driveway. It was the state police. And they come out and they told us, and he hands me Heather's driver's license that she had been in a fatal car crash. She was 17 and a half years old. That day changed our life like nothing else ever did. Several years ago, Colleen began to have some problems with her throat. She went to a, a couple of ENTs and was directed to a neurologist. And Colleen was told that she had Lou Gehrig disease, ALS. And it continued to deteriorate uh, to the point where Colleen was no longer able to speak. Colleen was getting weaker and it was beginning to affect her other muscles and she was no longer able to write. And Colleen said to me, she was just suffering at this point and she just wanted to be with the Lord. One Sunday, she was having uh, trouble with her breathing. It was, best way I could describe it, it was labored. We had a, uh, a nurse from hospice come over the next day, and she said that it might be best for Colleen to go into the hospice home. And I said, when would I be able to take her home? And the doctor said, she won't be leaving here. It was about 3.30 in the morning, and two nurses came in and uh, woke me and said that Colleen was gone. I'm, I'm standing there, my wife has passed away, and here she is, and what am I supposed to do? It was one thing to lose my daughter, and now I had lost Colleen, and I said, God, I said, you, you've taken away my entire family. The loneliness that I have felt as a result of losing my family was just, it just, it just beyond description. When Heather died, I questioned God's love for a long time. With Heather, with Colleen's death, I'm not questioning God's love. I know that, that he loves me and that he loves, loved her, still does. Colleen said this right after Heather had died, is that we knew because she had trusted Jesus as her Messiah she was absolutely in the presence of God because she had trusted him as her personal savior. When Colleen died, when the Lord took her, because I firmly believe that that's what, that what's what happened, is that Colleen in one instant was in this failing human body, and in the next instant, she was with the Lord. And I saw God's grace and his mercy in a way that I had not expected. I didn't know what it would look like, and then I realized this is what it looks like. And God showed his love that way. And she is fully alive with him. You see, when you come to believe in Jesus as your Messiah, it is not just about what's taking place here on earth, but those of us who believe that he is who he claimed to be, it means that there is eternal life. Wasn't that story just so powerful? It's amazing to me that Ellis lost everything, but he was still able to turn to Yeshua for the supernatural comfort that he needed. And that's a very different story from the next one you're about to hear. Bobby was young when she lost her mom to cancer, and in her grief, she decided to turn to the occult, a decision she would soon regret. 
Listen to find out how God broke through spiritual darkness to save Bobby and give her a brand new start. So we were doing the Ouija board and we said, are, are you a spirit? And we got the answer, yes. What's your name? And it spelled out Legion. I actually had a spirit come through me and it was changing my personality. I really became very dark. I had this cloud over me, this heaviness that I could not get rid of. Judaism was just part of daily life. Our families, we all lived within maybe a three or four block radius of each other. And on the holidays, on Shabbat, we would get together for these great family dinners. I don't know how they prepared all that food on Shabbat morning. We didn't light the gas. We didn't turn on the lights. We had, you know, a Gentile neighbor that would come and do those things. My parents decided to move about 30 miles away to a beach town. And much to my amazement, we were the only Jewish family on the street. We were always sort of odd man out tragedy hit my family. My mom was going to meet my dad and she swerved to avoid a drunk driver and she hit a brick wall. While she was at the hospital, they discovered that my mom had breast cancer. I watched her slip away. My mother was the most charitable, giving, kind human being. All she wanted to do was do good for people. Where was God? Where was God? I had really kind of lost myself, lost my connection that I had known since I was a little girl, my connection to God, and it was, it felt so empty. There was a part of me that was like a big hole in my heart. We started doing things that I had never done and never envisioned doing in my life, like hanging out in bars started clubbing and um, getting involved with lots of men, tried marijuana a little bit. Sex and rock and roll were my drugs of choice. So some friends of mine were into the occult. I had already been dabbling in astrology, getting some sort of what I called psychic readings. Let me tell you, all kinds of things were happening, all kinds of things. So we were doing the Ouija board and we said, are, are you a spirit? And we got the answer, yes. And then, what's your name? And it spelled out Legion. And then we would levitate tables. And at one of these seances, I actually had a spirit come through me. I had this cloud over me, this heaviness that I could not get rid of. Well, that spirit, it was driving me crazy. And it was changing my personality. I really became very dark. How I was treating people was terrible. I was just, I had become mean and I had become angry and it was just like a personality transfer. I had a friend that I had met and he, I remembered him saying he was a minister. I had his number and I called him and I told him what happened. He said, well, well, you need to pray. He said, do you know how to pray? I said, I'm Jewish, of course I know how to pray. How does a Jewish person not know how to pray? And he said, well, okay, do you want me to pray with you? And I said, if it will get rid of this spirit, yes, like pray with me. And I said, that's it? And he said, that's it. I was laying in bed and all of a sudden I felt a presence in my room in the middle of the night and I opened my eyes and there was Jesus standing in my bedroom. And I'm like, I I'm Jewish, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm Jewish too. You belong to me. I'm setting you free because you're mine and you're gonna be okay. And then he was gone. Along, you know, this time, my friends, they always went to church and there was a revival. The pastor, Jerry Macklin, gave an altar call. The thing I remember him saying is, if you have a broken heart, come now to the altar because Jesus is the healer of broken hearts. The whole history of my life from when my mom died, the heartbreak of all of that just flooded me. And 
Somehow I knew if I got to that altar, that was where my healing would come. There was an answer. There was an answer to all this pain I had been in for so long. And I just kept remember saying, Jesus is in my heart. Jesus is in my heart. Jesus is in my heart. And it was transformational. I really started to think about my family. And I was thinking, oh boy, how are they going to receive this? Went to visit my brother. He went ballistic. He lost his mind. And this brother that I had been so, 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 so close to threw me out of his house. And he said, mom and dad would be rolling over in their graves. How could you do this? How could you do that to this, their memories? Get out of my house. I never want to see you again. And I was sobbing and weeping and sobbing. And it was like, David, don't do this. Don't do this. No. And he goes, get out. Just get out. I never want to see you again. And I walked to my car and my sister-in-law walked out with me. I'm so sorry, she said, but I just need to tell you something. There's a piece about you, Bobby. There's a change in you that I've never seen before. He'll, he'll come around. He'll come around. Don't let go of what you got. He'll come around. I used to look out, I had this most incredible view of the panorama of the cities of New York. And at night, how magnificent with all those lights. And as I was pondering them one night, there was an inner voice speaking to me, the Lord speaking to me through the Holy Spirit. And he said, Bobby, see every one of those lights, every one of those lights, imagine that they represent a soul. And he said, I came and died on that cross to save every one of those souls. I love every one of those souls as you're looking at those lights. But now just imagine, just imagine that every light that you're looking at went out except one. And just imagine that that one light is you. And you know what, Bobby, my daughter, if you were the only one, I still would have gone to the cross I still would have taken your sin. I still would have taken all of it on me just for you. In the years since she gave her life to Yeshua, Bobby has worked as a Hollywood producer, proclaiming God's name everywhere she goes. She is definitely not ashamed of her faith in the Messiah, just like Kurt Schneider, who was a Messianic rabbi. But like Bobby, Kurt's family was also angry when he told them he believed in Jesus. You will not believe what happened next. And the short, distinguished looking man looks at me and says, Kurt, you've been living for 20 years like a normal person, and I'm going to snap you out of this thing. I stood up, I said, well, can I leave? And one of his big bodyguards said, sit down. Growing up in a very Jewish cultural environment, it never really felt to me that God was a big part of anything. It was much more social. It was that you go to synagogue because you're Jewish, but I don't ever remember God being at the forefront of anything other than simply going through the liturgy, the memorized portion of the prayers that was just, once again, part of having a Jewish identity. I was a very committed athlete. I started wrestling in seventh grade, and every year I got more and more focused on this sport. I would go to sleep at night, and I'd envision myself with my hand raised being the state champ. And I got to the place where I felt there was nobody that I could not beat. I felt like I was in control. It was a great time in life, but things changed just like that. When I looked into the future as a senior in high school, now that wrestling was over, I realized that the world was so much bigger than I was, certainly so much bigger than the people that competed in my weight class in wrestling. I felt afraid. I lost my identity. I lost my purpose. I just got more and more lost and more and more confused. I spent as much time as possible just sleeping to escape the emotional turmoil that I was in. I asked myself, what can I do to give myself that feeling back that I had when I was wrestling? It was such a dark time for me 
that I had a difficult time remembering any of the good things that had happened to me in life. And I go to sleep one night. It was 1978. In the middle of the night, I was awoken from my sleep. Suddenly, in color, Jesus appeared on the cross. A ray of red light from straight through the sky beamed down on his head. God had just showed me that Jesus was the way to him. The vision lasted no more than two seconds, but I was aware what had happened. And I was so excited because somehow I knew that something supernatural had just happened to me. I got up the next morning. I started talking about it, telling everybody about it. I started devouring the Word of God. I was very naive as to what I was about to face when I started telling my Jewish family and friends about this experience. We drove to a hotel. There was a short, distinguished-looking man in a three-piece suit, and then he had two guys next to him, both of them over six feet tall, probably at least 200 pounds. And the short, distinguished-looking man looks at me and says, Kurt, you've been living for 20 years like a normal person, and I'm gonna snap you out of this thing. And I said, I'm not programmed. I just believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And he said, we've got nothing to worry about. I stood up, I said, well, can I leave? And one of his big bodyguards said, sit down. We went back to my home, but one of the bodyguards was with me. He slept in my bedroom that night so that I couldn't escape. And then the next morning, he and I drove to one of their rehabilitation houses in California. It wasn't too long after that. I walk in the home, I see that there's some suitcases standing right at the door. And my dad points out the window to the street, to the parking lot area. He says, you see those, that police car out there? We've probated you to the psychiatric ward of Mount Sinai Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Was locked up in the psychiatric ward for two months. It was one of the worst experiences I've ever had in my life. Every day I would wake up and there was no place to go. You couldn't get out. You were locked in this ward. It was a terrible, terrible experience. After two months, I was released. So as a Jewish person, I have been through a lot because of my faith in Jesus. But for me, when I saw the ray of red light in that vision come down on Jesus' head, I knew it was coming from God. I'm so solid in my faith in Jesus. Number one, because of the supernatural experiences I've had. Secondly, because I see how the whole Bible is a unified whole and how it all fits together. That going through experiences like the ones that I just described, it never shook my faith. I know that I know. Sure, there's been times that it's like I feel, well, God, where are you? I don't feel you. There's been times that I've got discouraged, but I've never wavered in my faith. See, when I built my life on wrestling, my life was built from the outside in. My life was dependent on something disconnected from myself. But when wrestling ended, I fell apart. Now I'm building my life on something that's from the inside out. Jesus said he had come to give life and to give it more abundantly, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. I've been on this track now for 40 years, and I can't wait to meet him face to face. God has a reward for everyone that will choose to follow him. Can you imagine being locked in a mental ward just for believing in Jesus? We can't help but be amazed by Kurt's supernatural hope. The journey is never easy, but God promised he would never leave us or forsake us. And that is a promise we can hold on to forever. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Our Hope. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Our Hope. If you like our show and want to know more, check out ourhopepodcast.com or chosenpeople.com. See you next time.